Hey there and welcome to Fountain at Home. My name is Nikki and I have the unique honor of being one of the pastors here at Fountain Church. We want to welcome you to church online today. If you're new here with us, we are so excited to have you with us and we would like to get to know you. So in the chat room over there, introduce yourself to us. We would like to know your name. We would like to know where you're from and also what your favorite flavor of ice cream is. All right. And so as we like to say around here at Fountain Church, welcome home. Finally, don't forget to share the love by sharing the link. So before we get started, drop that donut and that coffee, grab the link and share it on your social media accounts so that everybody you know can be helped today to take one step closer to God and closer to others. Now, we are super excited to worship our great King. So let's get our hearts ready today as we get into a time of worship. Are you ready? Because I am. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name just for the privilege and the honor, God, of being able to come to you in worship. We thank you for your son and we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. We ask that today, God, our worship, oh God, will be acceptable to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning, Fountain Church. We are so excited that you are here with us to worship with us for another amazing Sunday. And so would you sing this song with us? Good grace. We got a good God. We got a good Father. Amen. Everything with breath repeats 
the sound of children. Clean hands, good hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Can you sing that with us? Sweet wine, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound on his children. Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God, his name is Jesus.
I am so, so thankful for a God who sees us in our shelter, a God that is saying, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, a God who is saying to us today, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Even though we're living in unprecedented times, we just know and believe that God is doing something beautiful inside of you and through you in this season. Right now, we're in worship of God with our tithes and our offerings. And can I just say, we are so grateful that we are a generous church because of you. We've been able to care for people within our church. We want to reach people outside of our church. And we've been able to support and resource other local churches. Thank you so much for your generosity. It is truly making an eternal difference. 
As you can see on the screen, there are multiple ways to give at Fountain. You can text to give. You can go online by clicking on the giving tab on Church Online. There's a giving link in the Facebook chat, or you can mail in a check. We're gonna give you some time to prepare your tithes and your offerings, but first, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, God, that we get to give back for which you've entrusted back to us. So Father, I pray, God, over our time, our talents, our treasures, Lord, everything, God, that we're gonna give back towards you, Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would bless it. Lord, use, God, every penny, every dollar, God, to move people closer to you and closer to others. God, thank you for being a faithful God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, Fountain, I have a couple of things to keep you connected. First, our small groups are launching today. Small groups are our best way to help you to stay connected, new friendships, new series, get plugged into a small group today. Also, we have Growth Track Step 1 happening at 12.30 online. So spend one hour with Pastor Matt, hear the vision of the church, and how you can get personally connected here at Fountain. Also, parents, we have our kids' watch parties at 12.30 as well. If you've already registered, you don't need to register again. And then as well, this Thursday at 8 p.m. on our Facebook Live, we're doing our kids' bedtime stories. So mark in your calendar and we'll be sure to see you there. There are so many great things happening at Fountain. So go ahead, go to our online connect card, fill it out. And we can't wait to help you to take a next step. All right, guys, we are so excited. We're about to go in the message. We're in the middle of a series called In the Middle. Grab your notebook, grab your Bible, and let's dive in. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Fountain at Home to Church Online. So grateful you tuned in today. Here we are again, eight weeks into the shelter in place in Fountain Church. Can I just tell you that we love you. We miss you so much. We've been praying consistently for you. And if you're tuning in for the very first time, we'd like to say welcome home and make yourself at home. Uh, don't forget to fill out the Connect card because we would love to send you a little digital Starbucks gift card just to say thank you for joining us today as we continue in a series entitled In the Middle. We've been talking about how do you thrive in between the problem and the promise. I think some of us were so focused on what was and others of us were focused on what's ahead. But I truly believe that God wants to speak right now in the middle that God wants to do something in us right now in the middle, that God wants us to thrive in the middle. And so I wanna to talk to you a little bit around this idea of don't miss it. So look at somebody in your house right now and say, don't miss it. If nobody's there, just look at your TV, look at your phone and shout out, don't miss it. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus name, we thank you so much for our time together. I pray that as we open up your word, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, change us from the inside out. Make us more like you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, I think we all know how it feels to be late. I hate being late, but we all know how it feels to lose track of time, uh, maybe forget something on the calendar. Well, this happened to Jackie and I this last week. We're turning our garage into this little fitness center. So we're cleaning and you know we're getting ready to make a dump run. And it was about 3.15 in the afternoon. And we have this clock in the garage, it's kind of an old school clock. And so I looked up and it was 3.15. I was like, cool, we still have about 20 minutes to work because uh, I had to go to the dumps by four. Jackie had a Zoom call at five and then I had to pick up dinner at 5.15. And so we're working for another 20 minutes. I jump in the car, go to the dumps, I get there and it's closed. So I thought maybe shelter in place, they closed early. And then I get this frantic call from Jackie, babe, do you know what time it is? I could have just looked at the clock on the dash, but I didn't. I said, I don't know, it's about 3.45. She said, no, it's 4.45. And instantly I knew that I did not set the clock in the garage forward. And so from that point forward, it was, it was frantic, right? I rush home. Jackie's getting ready for her Zoom call. I grab the kids, shoot off to get dinner. It was crazy. And all of us, we've had moments like that, haven't we? Where it's just been a crazy moment. We were late for a meeting or we missed a meeting and we got, you get that feeling inside like, oh no. Or, or you were late for school and you had to walk into class and you were that person that everybody looks at and you're like, oh, super awkward. Uh, some of us were late to our Zoom calls. 
like, like Zoom meetings. How are we late to Zoom meetings so much? It's crazy. Like some of us literally have to go uh, two minutes from our bedroom to our living room or vice versa to the office, whatever the case may be. Don't be late to your Zoom meetings. But nevertheless, none of us like to be late. It's, it's the worst feeling in the world. But there's some things that, you know, uh, we can get over. We can get over a meeting. We can get over being late to school. But there's certain things that you shouldn't forget. You can't forget. Matter of fact, you better not forget like your anniversary. True story. Three years ago, we're sitting down, Jackie and I, with a couple, a married couple. And we're talking about, you know, how to have a bulletproof marriage and and, uh, how to have a strong marriage. And I'm talking about the importance of dates. And I said, man, our, our wedding anniversary is August 21st. 2005 and and we're talking through and their faces just go blank and I'm like did I say something and they're looking like uh oh and then I look at Jackie and Jackie's like mm-hmm and I thought no way please tell me it is not August 21st sure enough it was August 21st and I was like no so then I looked at the couple I said listen don't listen to me don't take after your pastor don't follow my advice I felt so bad and I know some of you are judging me right now and that's okay you can judge me you know you're a horrible pastor you're a horrible husband that's fair game and Jackie bless her heart she was so gracious to me because we had a super busy month no excuses but we had a super busy month and and so she was just super gracious but there's just some things that you better not forget And Jesus spoke to us, Jesus speaks to us through his word. And he says, listen, guys, there are some things that you don't want to forget. Matter of fact, there are some things that you better not forget. And he said, you need to understand the times. You need to understand the times that you're living in. Uh, We looked at this verse last week, Luke chapter 12, verses 54 and 56. Jesus said to the crowd, he says, when you see a cloud rising in the West, immediately you say it's going to rain and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot, and it is, meaning you're really good at interpreting interpreting the physical climate, right? The weather. But he says, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Jesus was saying, listen, you're so good at interpreting the weather, but you can't you don't understand the spiritual climate. You, you don't recognize the times that you're living in. And many of these people in the crowd, they missed it. You say they missed what? They missed Jesus. They missed the savior of the world, the Messiah, the first coming of Christ. They missed it. They're staring at the savior in the face and they didn't recognize him. Their hypocrisy and their spiritual blindness kept them from seeing the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for is right before them and they missed it. And so listen, this was their issue. (laughs) They missed the first coming, but for you and I, and as your pastor, if there's one thing that I don't want us to miss or be ignorant of, is that's his second coming, that Jesus is coming back. Let me give you a little bit of context. Jesus Christ steps out of heaven into bodily form, born of the virgin, lived a sinless life, the life that we should have lived, died a sinner's death, the death that we should have died, crucified on a cross, buried dead, risen from the grave, and then ascended into heaven. He told his disciples, he says, listen, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. And so I don't want us to miss this. I don't want us to miss this reality that Jesus is coming back. And there's gonna be some signs and seasons that he says, you better pay attention to because I'm coming back. He says in Revelation chapter 22, John is is, uh, getting revelation from the Lord And he says, he who is the faithful witness to all of these things says, and this is what the Lord Jesus said, yes, I am coming soon. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. And then John shouts him out. He says, amen, come Lord Jesus. And so so I want you to get this picture. Some of you guys might be saying, well, man, it's been over 2000 years. Like, what do you mean coming soon? And Peter gives us some insight into this. He said, there's gonna be mockers in the last days that that will say things like, man, where is he? It's been so long. Like, God, do you lose track of time? But Peter says, listen, God is not late. Rather, he's being patient because there are so many people that need to come to repentance. There are so many people that still need to come to know him. And so God's not delaying because he's late. He's delaying because he's saying, I don't want you to miss it. That there are people that I don't want them to miss it. He's giving us opportunity not to miss it. And so the question around this subject always comes up. This always comes up and it's even come up a lot recently. And this is the question is when? When is he coming? 
Like, when is all of this going to end? Is it now, like the coronavirus, like what is going on? Is this, is this part of the end time narrative? And many people have taken a shot, even in my lifetime, at trying to determine when the end is gonna come. Like many of you guys remember Y2K. They said that at the end of uh, the year of December 31st, 1999, that as soon as the clock hit midnight, that something was gonna happen. Like the computers were gonna glitch. There was gonna be this natural disaster. Something was gonna happen. And people really bought into it. Matter of fact, $100 billion was spent that year in preparation for the end of the world, in preparation for Y2K. And here we are. What about the Mayan calendar? Everybody thought uh, the end of the Mayan calendar was a sign of the end of the world. Uh, December 21st, 2012 is when the Mayan calendar ends. And everybody thought, not everybody, but many people thought, man, this is going to be the end of the world. The end of the Mayan calendar, this is it. And 2012 came and it's gone. Uh, and here we are still. There was also a guy by the name of Harold Camping. Now, Harold Camping was this radio kind of evangelist and he calculated somehow all the prophecies in scripture and did some numerical stuff. And he basically said the world is going to end in 1994. He wrote a book about it. And then 1994 came and it went. And then he said, no, 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 I missed it. I missed it. It's going to be May 21st, 2011. Like many of you guys remember seeing these billboards. He bought billboards all over the nation and said, man, May 21st, 2011. And people believed it, man. They, man, people quit their jobs. They racked up their credit cards. They, they did some crazy stuff in preparing for this. And then May 21st came and we were still here. Then he said, no, 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 I missed it. it was, it's October. And then October came and we, was, we were still here. And then Harold um, he passed away in 2013. So his end came, but we're still here. And so the, the question still begs though, we all are wondering, when is this gonna happen? We want to know when. Well, Jesus makes this very clear. And as much as we don't wanna hear it, even for us who are followers of Jesus, and we know what I'm about to show you, like you know the answer to this question, it still doesn't make it easy sometimes, right? Jesus said it like this. He said, however, no one knows the day or the hour. Now, this, this, uh, these two words, no one in the Greek, do you want to know what it means? It means no one. Uh, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. Now, I know this can be extremely frustrating because none of us like to be in the middle, waiting, wondering, right? In between the problem and the promise. It, it's frustrating. Like, like for us right here in shelter in place, we can feel the gravity of the waiting. Many of us are asking, man, when is this virus gonna go away? When is this shelter in place going to lift so that we can get back to life? And if we're not careful, we can be so focused on what's outside of our control that we fail to prep and focus on what is in our control, right? So I think we can be so consumed with what's outside of our control that we lose focus of what is really in our control, like preparation. Like as a church right now, we're preparing that the moment they start to give us opportunity to gather again, we wanna be ready for that. So we're looking into sanitization and creating safe environments and all these different things so that the moment they say the shelter in place is lifted, man, we are ready to go. And so I would just propose to you how much more for the second coming of Jesus, how much more important it is if we're going through all this preparation for the shelter in place, waiting for it to lift, preparing for it to lift, how much more should we be prepared for the second coming of Christ? How much more discerning should we be in regards to the times that we're living in? Now, I always joke around to say that if we knew when Jesus was coming back, like if we knew he was coming back in 30 minutes, some of us would be like, man, I got 20 minutes to be a jerk and to be mean. And then I need about 10 minutes to repent before Jesus comes and goes, goes to be with him. But the fact that we don't know, it does kind of keep us on our toes a little bit. And, and this whole idea about the end of the world is not just talked about by Christians and pastors and, and things of that sort. Like, like there are atheists and skeptics and agnostics and scientists that are talking about the end of the world. There's a sense of, of maybe it's close. Like for example, some would say, there's some theories on climate change that maybe climate change is gonna be the end of the world, right? Where uh, the glaciers are melting and sea levels are rising. Some have predicted that uh, Miami is gonna be underwater in just several, se several years. 
Uh, some believe an asteroid may uh, come from outer space and hit the earth and, and that will be the end. Others have said nuclear war is going to be how the world ends, right? For generations now, we've been able to push a button and really blow up the earth. And some believe maybe that's how it's going to end. Overpopulation. Stephen Hawking came out and said, man, the world is way too populated. The capacity of the earth is not able to handle all of these people. And that is going to be how the end of the world comes. A uh, Pandemic. Right, people have been talking about pandemics for a long period of time, like the Spanish flu. Over, uh, I think it was uh, more people died uh, during the Spanish flu than they did in World War I. I mean, there was a lot of people that died. And so we see these pandemics throughout history, the plagues, and people have, have speculated that maybe pandemics is, is going to be how the world ends. And so you can anticipate there's all these movies out like Pandemic and Contagion, that when you, when you look at these things, it's like, whoa, the coronavirus, like this is happening now. Could this be it? It's just a sign of the end. And people are asking those questions. Uh, artificial intelligence. This may seem really far out there, but some people really believe that, man, robots and computers are going to take over at some point. We'll be like a subspecies and they're going to wipe us out. People are talking about this stuff. And then aliens. Somebody told me recently that the Pentagon, Pentagon released some pictures of potential alien, you know, I don't know, flying saucers or UFOs or something. And some people believe that aliens are going to invade and, and going to take over the earth. And that's how the world is going to end. And so you can see there's a ton of different theories. But this is why I stick with the scriptures. This is why I stick with the Bible. This is why I stick with Jesus. Not because I have a good feeling about it or because it just makes me feel warm inside to believe in God. No, but because as we look throughout history and the prophetic reality of scripture, that when God speaks and he says something is going to happen, he has a hundred percent track record. All right, let me take Jesus, for example, like the Messiah. And there were so many prophecies about the Messiah to come written hundreds and even over a thousand years before Jesus came to earth. Now, this guy by the name of, of, of Stoner, he wanted to do the scientific probability of what would it be like if one man fulfilled just eight of those prophecies? And here's the reality is Jesus fulfilled all of them. But he said, let's just take eight. So he did the scientific probability, the equation of what would be the, the, the probability of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies. And he came up with this number, one in 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power. That's one with 17 zeros behind it. That's a big number. But then he said, let's up the ante. Let's take 48 prophecies. And, and these prophecies, these 48, Jesus fulfilled all of them, many of which were spoken about, like I said, 500, even over a thousand years before Jesus even came to the planet, stepped out of heaven into time. Before that, it was told, this is what is going to take place when it comes to the, to the Messiah. So we said, let's take 48 prophecies and what are the chances and the probability scientifically of one man fulfilling 48 of these? And the, and the equation comes out to one in 10 to the 157th power. That is one with 50, 157 zeros behind it. I don't even know what that number is, but can I just tell you it's huge. What he was saying is, this is a miracle. This is, this is not even scientifically probable. This is a miracle that Christ fulfilling all of these prophecies that were told about him hundreds, even thousands of years before he came. This is a miracle. This is God. He said the probability would look like this. If you filled the state of Texas two feet with silver dollars, marked one with a Sharpie and sent a blind man in to go and get it, he said that is the probability of Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies that he did. Again, what is he saying? It's a miracle. You can't plan that. You can't makeshift that. You can't fabricate that. That is divine. All right, let me show you an example of this. As we look back in the Psalms, Psalm chapter 22, verses 12 through 18. This speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Like this is exactly explaining the crucifixion of Jesus. Here's the crazy part. 
is this was written a thousand years before Jesus was even born and before crucifixion had ever been invented. Listen, when God says something, his track record is still 100%. It's still 100%. And so even Jesus' disciples were asking this question though. They were asking, hey Lord, what should we anticipate at the end of the age? Like what are gonna be the signs that we are to pay attention to? And so in Matthew 24, Jesus gives them a little bit of a breakdown. He said, listen, in the last days, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Nation is going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famines and earthquakes in various places. He says, many are going to rise up and say, I am the Messiah or, or, or I am the Savior. And, and basically what he was saying was deception is going to be rampant both in the church and outside of the church. He said, you're going to be persecuted for my namesake. But then he said this, then he said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. What Jesus was saying was this good news about me is gonna be preached through all the world to all nations. And then he said, and then the end will come. It's a sign, pay attention to this. And we talked about this sign a few months ago. We talked about a few signs that I wanna bring back to you because I think they might feel a little bit more relevant uh, in the time that we're facing right now. Uh, But in in regards to global evangelism, I I, I want you to, to understand this, is that from the time that Jesus ascended, after he was crucified, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, from that time until 1970, 1.2 billion people had surrendered their life to Christ. Now, this is going to be staggering because from 1970 to 2017, that number jumped to 2.6 billion. That's over half in a much shorter amount of time. Now, the reason why I bring this up again is because now since we've been in this this pandemic, in this crisis, man, the church has invaded the internet. I mean, I'm just, I'm wondering what the numbers are going to look like moving forward because now almost every church in the world has gone to the internet and more people have heard the gospel and have come to know Jesus as a result of this. I don't know what that number is going to look like, but I think it's going to be staggering. And so I think this is a sign to say, hey, whoa, like let's lean into this. Let's pay attention to this reality that the gospel is going forth to all nations in a very, at a very rapid pace in a short period of time. And and so there's also another sign we had talked about was satellite technology. Because many people are asking this right now, like, Pastor Matt, is this the end? Like, are are we getting close to the end of the world? Is is Jesus coming back soon? Are we in the end times? Well, the answer to that question is we've been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven and we've been waiting for his return. But are we getting closer? Well, that's where we lean in and pay attention to the signs, like satellite technology. Because we have in Revelation chapter 11, verses seven through nine, let me kind of set the context for you. Uh, this is taking place during the tribulation, which is kind of the end of the end. There's this climax of, of everything that scripture talks about um, before the return of Christ. And so it, it's pretty intense. And two witnesses are gonna come on the scene testifying to the truth of God. Many believe it's gonna be Moses and Elisha because it was said that the two witnesses, one of them could keep it from raining. The other one could turn water into blood, uh, which is consistent with the miracles that God did through Moses and Elisha. And it says that uh, when these guys came on the scene, it says when they completed their testimony, nobody could destroy them or kill them until their testimony was done, until God said, all right, you're done. And it says, when they completed their testimony, the beast, which is the Antichrist, which is gonna be uh, someone who's on the scene, who was satanically possessed in a position of global power, um, global influence, uh, is, is called the beast. The beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and will conquer and kill them, speaking of the two witnesses. But check this out. It says, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city where the Lord was crucified, And for three and a half days, all the peoples, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies, right? No one will be allowed to bury them. Well, how is that going to be possible? Man, we just pull out our iPhone, right? I mean, think about it right now, like Facebook Live. I mean, we can go live across the globe. So what am I saying? Am I saying this is the end? No, I'm not saying that at all. No one knows. But what I am saying is that in the time that we're living in, this is possible. This is possible. It's a sign. And I think it's something we need to pay attention to. Another sign is global currency. Look at Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17. It says, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had this mark, 
which is the name of the beast, the beast being the Antichrist, this global ruler, leader, influencer that I was talking about, infused, possessed by Satan, or the number of its name, which the next verse says the number of its name is 666. And so many people back in the day thought maybe this will be a tattoo on, on, on your right hand or your forehead. But I think today it's much more plausible with chip technology. Like for example, in Sweden right now, over 10,000 people have, have, have been infused with microchips, small little rice grain sized chips in their right hand so that they can buy and sell. It, 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 it is their identification and it allows for keyless entry. And so MSNBC Nightly News, they did a story on it, bionic banking, credit card chips inserted into hands, right? Really interesting. And the reporter walked around with this guy as he was, you know, uh, logging into uh, his office. You know, he didn't need a key, just put his hand up. And when they went to the cafeteria to try to get a drink, the door to the refrigerator wouldn't open until he scanned his hand and the refrigerator opens up, it charges him, everything. So, so again, what am I saying? Am I saying that the end is now? No, but I'm saying, man, this is, it looks pretty feasible that in our time, something like that could really take place. Now, paying attention to these signs are super important. The signs of the times, we cannot be ignorant of the signs of the times that we're living in. But I just don't want to pay attention to physical signs. That's one aspect, but I don't want to be consumed with just wondering, man, is this it? Is the chip technology, is that going to be it? Because on top of just looking at the signs, I think there's another thing that's really, really important. If you're taking notes, you can jot this down, is that I want to make sure that I'm leaning into the Holy Spirit, that I'm paying attention to the, the physical signs, but I'm also leaning into the Holy Spirit. You say, well, why, why, why is that so important? There's a verse that I never saw in this way until this week. And it says this, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, right? He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. And I love this part. Look at this. He will tell you about the future or he will tell you about the things to come. And so, so I think this is interesting because, you know, we don't want to just pay attention to the physical signs, but rather we want to lean into the Holy Spirit so that we can discern those signs, so that we can discern and understand, hey, is this it? Because the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth and He'll let us know about the future. He'll let us know about the things to come. I really believe that if we lean into the Holy Spirit, when those moments come and those moments arise, that the Spirit of God will be faithful to let us know and to lead us into all truth and, and that we can be prepared as we navigate this season. And so, so like, like for instance, when I used to work at a bank, they would say the best way to, to know or notice a counterfeit is not by studying the counterfeit. It's by studying the what? The real thing. Like the more that you handle real currency when you're counting money, when a fake one is inserted, you can just feel it. You recognize it because you're so familiar with the truth. And so, so I would propose the same thing, man. We need to spend a lot of time with the Holy Spirit. We need to lean in, just like we talked about last week, get alone with God, let his words shape and revamp and, and infuse our hearts with truth that when the counterfeit comes, I'll be able to recognize it. Uh, I'm reminded of a rabbi. He was out tending uh, some sheep. And as he was out tending his sheep, he, he saw that one of his sheep had gotten a little bit close to the cliff or to the edge where there was this huge drop off. And so as he went over there and gathered his sheep, he recognized also that there was a little trickle of water, a little stream of water that was flowing off of the cliff onto a boulder below. And he, and he, said, he said something was so interesting. He said that this little trickle of water, as he looked down below, put a huge indention into the stone. And he said he had this moment where he thought, man, if this little trickle of water over a long period of time could put this huge impression in a boulder, then certainly daily time in God's word, as God's words trickles on my heart, can move my heart to a heart of stone, to a heart of flesh and put a huge impression on it. And that's what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, we just wanna be so infused with the truth of God that when the counterfeit comes, we won't miss it. But number two, if you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down, is I also don't wanna be so consumed with the wonder of when, like when is all this gonna happen? But rather I wanna be consumed with the commission of now. Like Jesus has given us a commission to go into the world in Matthew 28 and make disciples of all nations. This is why he delays. This is why he tarries is because there's still a mission to be fulfilled. There's still people to reach. 
And so I want to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, he said, to obey everything that I've commanded. And then he said, know that I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So I just don't want to be consumed with the wonder of when, but I want to be consumed with the commission of now. You see, in the beginning of this year, when the Lord gave us this vision to make space, the, the parable that he gave us was found in Matthew chapter 25. And it was the parable of the 10 virgins or the 10 bridesmaids. And it's a parable of preparation. And I really believe that that's the season we're in now. We've kind of have come out of the season of panic um, with this whole coronavirus deal. And now we're in the season of preparation. Like what are we doing right now in the middle? How are we preparing for what's ahead? And this, this whole parable is about preparation. There were uh, five wise bridesmaids and five foolish ones. And it said that as they were waiting for the bridegroom, right, one of the things that they would do was when the bridegroom would come, they would light their torches that would be full of oil and they would proceed on um, to be with the bridegroom. And so in this pa parable, the, the bridegroom shows up and five of them have oil and five of them don't. But here's the crazy part is they all looked like they had oil. They all looked like they were prepared. I, I mean, the ones that didn't have oil, the foolish ones, they had all the outer garments. They looked just like the prepared ones, but they had no oil. They looked great on the outside, but they had no inner oil on the inside. So when the bridegroom showed up, they missed their moment. And we pick up in that verse as I close in Matthew chapter 25, verses 10 through 13. It says, but while they were gone to buy oil, because they went out, they said, we don't have any oil. And the, and the other uh, wise one said, hey, listen, we don't have enough. Like you got to go find your own oil. And so when they went out to buy oil, the bridegroom came and those who were ready, they went in, those who were ready, those who were prepared, they went in to the marriage feast. And this is the most heartbreaking phrase that has haunted me over these, uh, since January. It's just God has illuminated this in my heart and my mind to a different level. Is that then the door was shut. The door was shut. The time was up. They had no oil. The bridegroom came and Jesus is speaking of his second coming. He's speaking of his return and they weren't ready. And this is later when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. Like there's nothing worse than having all the outer garments. Like you can grow up in church, you can know all the right answers, you can know all of that and still not know Jesus. And so this just breaks my heart because I just don't wanna be prepared for me. Like there's a great commission. I, I, wanna, I wanna be mindful that there are others that look like they're fine, but they have no oil. And I wanna make sure that we're doing all that we can to reach those who may even look like they're saved, but they're not. And those who are far from God, those who are, you know, apparently, man, they have no relationship with Jesus, maybe never heard the gospel. I just don't wanna be prepared for me. How selfish is that, that we have the best news on the planet and we're preparing, but we're not letting others know because there's coming a day where the door will be shut. And how heartbreaking, I mean, friends and family, people that I love and care about, I don't want them to say, why didn't you ever tell me? Like, like you spent so much time with me and you never shared. Like, I don't wanna be that guy. There's just no way. And he says, I, I don't even know you. So you too, Jesus said, must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. This word in the Greek is gorgario, this keep watch. And it literally means to stay awake. And so can I just encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, don't let this world lullaby you to sleep its anxieties, its pleasures, its distractions. Uh, don't let it lullaby you to sleep where you are not prepared and you forget that it's not just about the wonder of when, but it's about the commission of now. That there's still so many people that need the good news of Jesus, that the Lord is, is being patient, He's waiting so that they can hear the good news. So let's make sure that we're prepared and let's make sure that we're getting others prepared, that we're, we're, we're going into the world, that we are on mission. Let us not fall asleep and lose sight of our own preparation, but also let us not lose sight of the mission so that we have strength to endure the times that we're facing. But here's the truth, here's the truth, is it's not just about the end of the world, but it's about the end of your world and it's about the end of others' worlds. So we can talk all about the end of the world, but the chances, listen, of our world coming to an end before the end of the world are probably a lot greater. James makes it very clear that this life is like a vapor. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. That you and I, we're not promised tomorrow and neither is our neighbor, neither is our family member, neither is our barista. 
And so I, I think that as we look at the times that we're living in, we can't just be enamored with the wonder of when. We have to be consumed with the commission of now because the reality is it's not just about the end of the world, but the end of your world. Maybe you don't know Jesus right now, and maybe today is that day. Or maybe you do know Jesus, but you're never opening up, opening up your mouth to let others know the good news. You say, well, what does it look like to be prepared? Well, Jesus said it best, and I'm gonna close with this. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, some, pe some of us, we don't wanna hear. We don't wanna think about the end of the world. It's scary. We don't, we don't wanna think about like what's gonna happen or, or, or what's it gonna look like. We just wanna act like none of that exists. We don't wanna think about the second coming of Christ. We don't wanna think about heaven and hell being a reality. But listen, that is not how you prepare. And can I just tell you the second coming of Christ as followers of Jesus, man, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of. And, and what does preparation look like? look like? It looks like practice. It looks, looks like not just hearing because some of us, we hear, but we're not practicing. Like we hear what Jesus is saying, but we're not putting it into practice. And Jesus said, those who put it into practice, what I say is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. See, a lot of times I think we wanna act like Jesus in the moment of challenge or trial. And then we find ourselves, man, it seems kind of hard sometimes like to love our neighbor or, or our enemy. We talked about this in Lunch with the Laces this last week. If you missed it, you can join us again this Wednesday on Zoom. We'd love for you to tune in. But we talked about how, man, sometimes it can feel like a burden to open up our Bibles and to pray or to love our enemies or to pray for those who persecute us. Because a lot of times we're trying in the moment to behave like Jesus without really embracing the entire life of Jesus. And so it's like, we're trying to, you know, like, like a, a kid who has a baseball player uh, as an idol would, would put on the cleats and, and his favorite, you know, jersey and dress just like the athlete. But then when he gets up to the plate and he tries to perform like the athlete, he can't. Why? Because he's trying to imitate him in the moment, but he hasn't embraced the lifestyle of that athlete, all the disciplines, all the, the different, you know, regiments that go into making your body's atomic system respond perfectly in those moments of challenge of crisis. And so what am I saying? I'm saying, we just don't want to try to, you know, take a little piece of advice from Jesus and say, all right, I'm going to try to make it work. No, I'm saying embrace the entire life of Christ. Surrender your entire life to him in that place. It will be really hard not to love your enemy. It'll be really hard not to share the good news of Jesus. It'll be really hard not to do those things and it won't feel like a burden. Trust me, it won't feel like a burden. It will be the natural flow and response as the Spirit of God is operating in and through you. So Jesus said, don't just hear, but put them into practice because you'll be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And he says, the foolish man builds his house on the sand. And he said, the wind and the rain is coming. Like the reality is this, we're not getting away from the wind and the rain. We can't avoid it. It's coming, but if we build our house on Christ, if we build our house on the rock, then what did Jesus say? He said, the rain will come down because it's coming. The streams will rise and they will, and the winds will blow and beat against the house and it's gonna happen. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Ladies and gentlemen, are we living in the end times? Yes, we are. Uh, we've been living in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven and us waiting for his return. Is the end close? I don't know. No one knows. I do know the signs. Some of the signs that Jesus has given us, they're pretty clear. Are they possible in our lifetime? Yes. Will they happen in our lifetime? I don't know. But this is what I do know is I want to lean into the Holy Spirit of truth that he would uh, lead us into all truth and let us know and help us to discern the things that are to come. And I don't wanna be consumed with the wonder of when. I wanna be prepared and I wanna be mindful, but I, I wanna be consumed with commission of now because it's not just about the end of the world, it's about the end of your world and the end of others' world. And the question is, are you prepared? Like maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Like you're not ready for his second coming. You're not ready to go and meet with him if you were to die today. Like you're not secure when it comes to your eternity. Can I just tell you that you don't have to live like that. That's why Jesus came. <clears throat> the Bible says that when you confess Jesus as Lord, Paul tells us in Ephesians that the Spirit of God comes on the inside of us and seals us to the day 
of redemption to the day when we go to be with him, whether it's uh, uh, our time comes before he returns or whether it's he returns in our lifetime. The goal is that we are sealed with the spirit of God and our eternity is secure. So can I pray with you right now? If that's you, you say, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. Just pray this with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, Lord, I surrender to you today. I confess you as my Lord. I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sin, that I would be forgiven and that my eternity would be secure. I repent for my sin. I repent and I turn from my way to you. And I ask that you would forgive me, that you would wash me clean, that you would make me brand new. Fill me with your spirit. Holy Spirit, lead me into all truth and prepare me for the things to come. I surrender my life to you. And Lord, may I not be consumed with the wonder of when, but rather the commission of now. Use me to reach others in your name, Jesus. Amen. And listen to me, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, and maybe you just haven't been sharing your faith. Remember, it's not just about the end of the world. It's about the end of not just your world, but also others. And maybe today you need to make a fresh commitment to reach out to your family, to reach out to a neighbor, to reach out uh, to a stranger that God puts in our path. God has not placed you in your areas of influence by accident. And I'm just telling you, God is not going to use me to reach the people he's called you to reach. And so I want to encourage you today, not out of guilt or condemnation, but, but out of the abundance and the goodness of how good God has been to you. Man, let the good news of Jesus come off of your lips. Be a part of this global evangelism, this end time sign that we go and we tell people the good news of God's grace, of his love, of his redemption for them, that they might come to know him personally. Well, listen, if you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus for the first time, or maybe you rededicated your life today, listen, we wanna celebrate with you. Come on, everybody, can we give a big hand to the Lord and celebrate with all of those that made a decision today? I wanna take a moment to point you to the Connect card. Now, the Connect card is how we take next steps. So if you gave your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicated your life, go ahead and mark that box on the Connect card that best applies there. Uh, if you need to take a next step, whether it's uh, jumping into a small group, small groups are getting ready to kick off. We'd love to get you signed up for a Zoom group. So you can mark your Connect card. You can go to our website. You can find a group that best fits you. We're gonna go through Psalm 23. It's gonna be so rich. It's gonna be so good. You're not gonna want to miss our Zoom groups this semester. You're also able to mark your Connect card for water baptism. We're trying to figure out uh, if you've given your life to Jesus and need to be water baptized, how do we do that in shelter in place? We have some ideas uh, that we're working through. So please still mark that on your Connect card so we can get you prepared and ready. Uh, we have Growth Track Step 1 happening at 1230 today. I'd love to take a few minutes with you over Zoom. We'll have some coffee together. I'll talk a little bit about our church, the mission and our vision and how you get connected. Uh, it's gonna be so much fun. You can ask me any question that you want personally about our church ministry. At the end, we have a blast. Can't wait to see you there. It'll be about 60 to 70 minutes uh, together. Make sure you sign up because we do need to send you a Zoom link. So we wanna make sure that you're connected there. And then lastly, we have lunch with the Lacey's on Wednesdays. Uh, it's it's uh, over Zoom, so you need to sign up on your Connect card. Uh, we're just talking life. We wanna encourage you, we wanna equip you. And so uh, if you missed last week, we had so much fun together. Don't miss this week. Sign up on your Connect card. We'll send you a Zoom link. Uh, whether you're an essential worker and you take a lunch break or you're in shelter in place at home, uh, we'd love to connect with you on Wednesday at 12 for lunch. Well, listen, we love you so much. We are praying for you, Fountain Church. If you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to serve. And remember, lean in in the times that we're living in. Lean into the Holy Spirit. And don't be consumed with the wonder of when but rather be consumed with the commission of now. We love you so much, praying for you. We'll talk to you soon. Wasn't that an incredible message? Our prayer for you today is that God is speaking to you and that life change is beginning to happen. At 12.30 today, we have our kids Zoom parties. And then we also have Grow Track Step 1 live with Pastor Matt. And don't forget, small groups launch today. So. Go on our website and pick a small group because life change happens in the context of small groups. Don't forget also, follow us on our social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We love you, we're praying for you. Have a great week ahead.